All right, there's not too many Z690 ITX boards that are on DDR4, and the Gigabyte Aorus is one of your lower cost entry points into the Elder Lake ecosystem, if you could even describe a $290 board as that. So today I'll share some of my experiences with this board and what you might want to know before springing for it. Welcome to Machines and More. We took a look at the Intel 12600K and it is one seriously impressive CPU. For the testing with DDR4, I paired it with this board here, and this is the Gigabyte Aorus Ultra Z690 ITX board, and it ran well. There weren't any major hiccups in terms of the CPU performance, at least when the board was working properly. Now, it's still early-ish. We're still a month inside of release. It's still early adopter time, but I gotta say, this board still doesn't seem quite ready for release, and as of right now, early December 2021, I'd still recommend waiting and I'll talk through some of that decision in a bit, but let's just take a look at the board. Let's do a walkthrough, and how about we do it as a good, bad, and ugly. All right, so for the good, there is a DDR5 version of this board, but this version is DDR4, and that still makes a lot of sense, especially for a 12600K build. If you're migrating a recent build, you can keep your existing DDR4 RAM, which is nice because DDR5 is going to cost you a lot more for just a small performance bump at this point in time. Not to mention that the DDR5 boards are going to cost you way more. Now, I haven't seen the DDR5 version of this board for sale just yet, but uh, figure the MSI one is 400 bucks and the ASUS is even more at 440. Just like the previous Z590i and Z490i boards from Gigabyte, it's a well-made board. It's a heavy, thick PCB. It's got a substantial back plate, and this is a 10 plus 1 plus 2 VRM setup with 105 amp stages. So it is quite overkill for stock use for even say a 12900K, but good power delivery is always fine, and it's a boon for stable overclocking. A total of four fan headers for a mini ITX board, that's plenty. And there's a regular four pin header at the top of the board next to the EPS power right here. And then there's two mini headers that need a dongle like this. Uh, that's for an optional CPU header, a case fan header, and then towards the bottom of the board on the starter board here, there's a mini header for additional case fans. Of course, these are just names and they can be repurposed to what you need and you can control the fan curve. You've got an integrated rear IO shield, plenty of IO. There's a total of seven type A ports and one type C port at the back. 2.5 G ethernet and not so great on the audio since it just has a line out and mic, but eh, it's okay. Wi-Fi 6 and you've got a type C front header right here and an internal 2.0 header that can be split out to two downstream devices with a dongle. And that's handy if say your AIO needs one and you have something else that also uses that connection. Now this board cooling is passive, so there are no chipset fans to contend with and that's nice. And at the top is a heat fin array which helps passively vent off that heat. It says fins array, if you didn't know what that's for. And your case airflow will help expedite that process as well. And it's connected to this section here with a heat pipe. Now I did overclock the 12600K and for multi-threaded workloads, it can make a decent difference. I felt comfortable pushing the performance course to 5.0 gigahertz on 1.3 volts with the Noctua U12A and that was the highest I could go on 1.3 volts. Uh, which was the voltage where I felt I could still keep thermals under control with a single tower air cooler at around 80 degrees on the CPU in a 20 degree ambient room. And uh, that still did yield a meaningful performance boost. Uh, just for reference, this is catching up to the Ryzen 9 3900X. And uh, for a productivity workload such as in Blender, you will get a meaningful boost off of stock levels. For gaming, those gains aren't as meaningful, but it is still a gain nonetheless. I did run the overclocked chip pushing 160 plus watts for Blender to do 40 minutes of rendering. And during that entire time, the highest the VRM most temps that I saw was 46 degrees and the chipset also hit around the same temperature. So really no concerns at all there. And it'll be just fine for a 12700K or a 12900K. These power stages are just very well spec. And especially if your case has decent airflow, the board cooling isn't anything I'd worry about. Both the M.2 drives on this board sit on a daughter board under this massive heatsink. Uh, it's connected via a board to board or BTV plug. And that choice is a bit questionable, which gets us to the first part of the bad. So the bad, it isn't necessarily unique to this board. It all starts with the bigger LGA 1700 socket shape. And that's this taller rectangular shape 
Because of the limited footprint of your 17x17 17 17 Mini ITX board, it forces a lot of headers to some weird places because you basically have no more real estate at the top. However, Gigabyte's choice to locate some of those headers is especially egregious. Now take, for example, the front audio header. That's normally just a simple header on the board. Sometimes it's to the left of the expansion slot. Sometimes it's to the right, and sometimes you have these short dongle cables. Okay, but <laughs> look at this. They've located this one to where you have to remove the chunky heat sink, remove the M.2 daughter board, and then pull this dongle out of this hole here, and then you still only get this stubby connector and that's going to be in the way of your graphics card. That does get worse for a ton of these headers. They're located on the bottom of the daughter board, more notably your DRGB, a second case fan header, your USB 2.0 hub, and that's a lot of junk and cables in an area that is very difficult to cable manage since you have your graphics card covering this part right here. So everything is going to be coming out of the top of that card. Then this huge chunky heatsink is level with the IO side of the heatsink, and that's pretty limiting for your cooler selection. Now most 120 millimeter towers will not clear unless you remove that heatsink, and that's what I had to do for the U12A for the 12600K testing. Low profile coolers aren't a good fit either. Noctua flat out says the L12S or L12 Ghost won't fit, and that's true except that if you really needed to, you could just run one stick of RAM and the heatsink will clear this way, but yeah, it's totally not optimal for most setups. Now, I didn't have the Big Shuriken 3 handy to test, but that needs a footprint of 12 by 12 centimeters, and you just don't have it with this layout. If you can go up to a Noctua C14S, that can work, but you won't be able to fit a fan underneath it. As far as air coolers go, if you want to retain this nonsense, the safest bet is a 92 millimeter tower such as the U9S since that just about clears without any issue. And yeah, something tiny like the L9 will work, but yeah, don't go there. That's just too little cooler for too much power uh, to get by. For AIOs, I test for the Cooler Master unit from the Max case and it fits without any issues. So as long as your pump head doesn't protrude beyond the LGA 1700 hole pattern, you should be fine. And for some of the hotter chips, that is definitely the route I would take unless you want to junk the chunk and replace the heatsink with uh, the aftermarket type of uh, heatsink, such as an EK uh, M.2 heatsink, which I'll link down below. However, just for context, I ran an M.2 drive bare with no heatsink and even with the RTX 3080's exhaust blowing in the vicinity, the hottest my drive got during a Far Cry 6 session for about uh, half an hour was 56 degrees. So more than likely, your drive will be fine. Now, you, if you're concerned, you could also put the drive on the bottom, which has a thermal pad, and it is connected to this small heatsink here uh, via this uh, thermal pad. That being said, I still feel like this could have been mitigated by locating one of the drives on the back of the board, which traditionally would be right here, but this covered up here. And uh, that's the way it's been done with other Gigabyte Mini ITX boards. And that would have avoided the need for this super tall assembly here, which even as it is, shouldn't need to be this big. I mean, even half this thickness would be fine and that would make coolers a little bit more compatible. Now, if there's any silver lining, this makes an absolutely fabulous paperweight. Now, all this talk about M.2 drive thermals and performance would be great if they worked properly, but that's what gets us to the ugly here. I did the initial testing with a SATA SSD since the M.2 would not work out of the box and would not detect the drive on the first BIOS. After updating to the November 19th BIOS, there was a glimmer of hope. I did get the M.2 to work, but only when connected to an HDMI 2.0 monitor and there was no initial BIOS, like a boot screen. And uh, when hooked up to the display port, I did get the boot screen, but then no M.2. But then after a few restarts on the HDMI 2.0 with the same monitor, the M.2, which didn't change at all, was now not detected. So something is still iffy with the second BIOS. Uh, on my front panel USB, one port worked, one port didn't. Uh, the rear USB was hit or miss. Sometimes one of the ports worked and then it didn't. And uh, even on the second BIOS release, I think this board is not ready for release yet. And it just feels a little bit too rushed, even one month in. Now I have no reason to believe that Gigabyte won't address that in a future BIOS update, but we are getting out of the early adopter stage being about a month in and that there is the main reason why I can't recommend it just yet. Now, if there could be a nail in the coffin for this board, check this out. That's coil wine with a motherboard. Now, 
okay, with a graphics card nowadays, that's not so uncommon. But mind you, this was at idle with this port, and it's not like it happened with a high power being drawn. Now, it's a shame because performance with the CPU, it's completely there. And it's a fantastic combo in terms of gaming performance and the price point is in line with their two previous Intel chipset boards, which is good considering the alternatives. And I like the board features and the power stages, but I really dislike the layout. And I think this daughter board assembly, it's, it's too much. And um, if you get this board at least right now, just make sure you have in mind what cooler you wanna run in order to save yourself the headache later on. So I hope you found that helpful. Sorry, it wasn't a great glowing review on this uh, motherboard, but that's good info for you, I hope. And that'll do it for this review. Let me know if you have any questions, uh, comments, uh, thumbs up if you liked it, subscribe. Thanks for watching.